Welcome to The Bridge Online. No matter where you're joining from, we are glad to have you here. We have a great message today, but before we dive into that, here are your weekly announcements. The second food pantry of April will be tomorrow morning, April 26th, from 10 to noon. If you or someone you know is in need, don't hesitate to come out and let us serve you. Immediately following the second service today will be the Pregnancy Care Center 5K, hosted right here at the Bridge of Hope. We are fundraising for the many programs that the Pregnancy Care Center offers to families in need. With your help, we can make a huge difference for this great ministry. If you want to walk or sponsor a walker, meet at the barn after second service. There will be a light snack and water provided. Tonight at 6 p.m. will be our meet and greet with our new youth pastor, Matt Furnish, and his family. This will be for all junior high and high school students as well as your parents. So come out tonight, meet Pastor Matt, Stephanie, and the family, and ask any questions you have as well as get to know them a little better. That's all we have this week for announcements. If you missed anything or you have any questions, visit our Facebook page or our website at thebridge129.org. Pastor Charlotte has an awesome message for us today. So grab your Bible, a notebook, and let's dive in. Well, that said, last week we made an, uh, an important announcement. We announced our new youth pastor, uh, Matt and Stephanie Furnish, and they were finishing up at their, uh, at their church and celebrating and their church was just sending them off with a, with a great celebration. And, and today, instead of, instead of on, uh, on the screen, you can get to see their beautiful faces in person. And so we want to do an official welcome to the family, to our new youth pastors, Matt and Stephanie Furnish. Guys, will you come up here and let them see you really quick? Come on, everybody. Make them welcome as they come. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, yes, praise God. So we're excited. We're excited to have them. Um, they're coming from Edinburgh, live in Edinburgh, pa uh, was doing youth pastor ministry uh, in Franklin, Indiana. And so now they're here with us. But they're not new to this area, really. Matt grew up in, well, Stephanie is, but Matt's not. He grew up in this area. As you know, Matt is uh, Arlene, Jim and Arlene, Evan's grandson, Vance and Kim's son, and so we're just excited that they're joining us and partnering with us in this journey that we're on. Um, tonight at 6 o'clock, there is going to be a meet and greet with them for all junior high and high school students, as well as your parents. So I want to encourage you, strongly encourage you to come and be a part of that. At 6 o'clock, we'll just kind of let the kids get to know them a little bit. We'll take a few minutes to do that. And then the parents and, and the high school students will kind of all go and get together and just talk and just share, give a little bit of idea of vision, what the future looks like, um, what the plans are as of right now, moving forward, and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Um, I think it's important and imperative. I didn't say it last week. I think maybe I did in one of the services. I did in both. But it is important to understand that all of the folks that have been a part of youth ministry up until now we, we, there are no issues, there are no problems. Um, you, you may not have known, but all of them were bivocational. And so they were, they were working tirelessly uh, at their secular job and then working tirelessly in youth ministry. And I'm just going to tell you, that's tough. That's, that's difficult to do. And so um, we, they just kind of came to a place where we realized, like, hey, it's, it's time for me to maybe step back a little bit. Uh, which caused us to begin this journey of looking and praying and seeking out someone that could come on and take on youth ministry as a full-time position. And so that's where we are today. There, there was no failure, no split, no issue. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing of that. It was literally just filling a, fill, fill, filling a need that, that began to arise. And so we're excited, which means a lot of our volunteers will, will be a part in some way. We're going to be talking about that as we move forward uh, we're not we're not axing anyone or anyone's out. We're just we're just kind of making some transition. And transition, I know, can can scare some folks. But don't be scared. This is this is a benefit. I, I like to think of it this way, and I really do mean this. Um, as a church body, we are investing in our junior high and high school students. I'm telling you that. That's what we're doing. The next generation is important to us, and it, it's important enough that we would bring in. Uh, a family who loves children, who has a gifting and a calling from God to minister to young people, uh, junior high and high school students. And so 
uh, we're excited and we're looking forward to the future. So real quick, I'm just going to have Matt uh, put him on the spot and have him say something. Hey, thank you guys for uh, welcoming us. We are really excited to be here. Um, as he said, I've been doing uh, youth ministry for quite a while now, and I'm really excited to be back in my home area. Um, and just, I'm looking forward to getting the chance to meeting all your students. Um, I already met a few the other night, and what a great group you guys have. And I understand there's a lot more here, and I cannot wait to track you guys down if you're six grade to 12th grade, and you don't come see me, I will track you down. I will find you. And if I have to, I will drag you to church myself. Um, so, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, thank you guys so much. I, we're excited to be here. Awesome. Praise God. Give them a hand. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Amen. If you get a chance, get them a cup of coffee in the lobby, in the cafe somewhere, and get a chance to talk to them. Give them time. They're here. They're here for the long term, so. Don't all bombard them at once, but maybe get a chance just for you to get to know them as well. But uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, if you can be here. Amen? So many of you know, we started a series a couple weeks ago called Purpose Driven. We've addressed uh, the church. Really what we're looking at is what is the biblical vision, the biblical purpose of four areas. The church, the family, women, the role and purpose of a woman, and the role and purpose of a man. And so today, uh, I am delighted to just turn over the pulpit to my wonderful wife because I don't know of anyone more qualified to teach you and preach to you of what a purpose-driven woman should look like. And so today, Charlotte is going to be sharing the word. I want you to make her welcome as she comes and shares purpose-driven woman. Amen. Hold on just a second. Isn't it just like a woman? You ask a couple men to do something, and then you got, and you, you got to touch it up. You just got to fix it. Otherwise, it's going to be bothering me the whole time. Thank you guys, though. I appreciate it. I really do appreciate it. All right. So let's. these are my granny's quilts. I had two awesome grannies. I called them my, my um, city granny and my country granny. Um, have you ever read the book? It's an old book of... Um, Town mouse and country mouse, that's how my grannies were. I had one granny that wrote, drove a little Volkswagen rabbit and zoomed through the streets of Cincinnati like nobody's business. I had another little granny that sat quietly in a holler, and she, I don't think I ever saw her drive, not one time. So I appreciate them. We'll get to these quilts at the end, so you can just sit and admire them for a little bit. All right? Okay, let's get in. Listen, I tried my best. Because I think, I don't know about you guys, but when I worship, if you're sitting anywhere around me, you're going to hear me singing. And I'm like, man, and I'm usually, I'm out of breath. And so I'm just like, man, I can't sing. And like, that's hard, right? To not sing. And, and you, you want to worship. And I'm just like, yeah, but then I'm going to be out of breath when I get up there. And so I'm trying very hard to catch my breath after worship. All right. So let's just recap just a little bit of Purpose Driven. One, we know that Jesus, everything he did had purpose, right? We learned that from the first sermon. And he's called us to live with purpose-filled lives as well. And so then we learn also in Luke 4, 15 through 16, or 16 through 19, what, those, what that purpose was. Preach the gospel, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom, recovery of sight and vision for the future, set captives free, proclaim the open door or season of grace, and we really, we do this all through the power, empowerment of the Holy Spirit, right? In Acts chapter 1, and verse 8, Jesus tells him, you will receive power once, my Holy, once the Holy Spirit has come to be my witnesses, right? That doesn't change. Despite the labels, despite being singled or married or pastor or teacher or whatever label you're, you happen to have on, maybe some of us have multiple, some of us have a very few, whatever that looks like. The calling's still the same. The purpose is still the same. So what does it look like for a purpose-driven woman? And we're going to take a look at her today. We're going to take a look at two instances. One, very general, uh, general purpose-driven woman. And then we're going to look at a woman in the home. So if you're with me, um, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. What? She's not going to Ephesians? I thought she was going to Ephesians. 
One thing about the Norman household is we love commercials. We're kind of nerdy that way. We like commercials. Currently, our favorite one right now is the dad with the Cheetle detector, the trace amounts of Cheetle, and he goes, what? So that's what we do, what? At the house, so we're a little nerdy that way, but it keeps it fun. All right, throughout the Old and New Testament, we see women in all kinds of different roles and responsibilities, but purpose doesn't change. We see them as judges, as preachers, we see them prophesy, we see them be deacons and wives and mothers, some were barren, and some were single, some were widowed, but they all had purpose. And they all had the same purpose. Live a life that glorifies God, yielded to the call to do whatever God was calling them to do, and to do it well. And we are those witnesses, performing and walking in their calling and gifting of God. They did this in the Old Testament, sharing that there was only one true God, and sharing the gospel in the new by bringing hope to the brokenhearted, sharing freedom in Christ, sharing the most precious treasure within them. So again, lots of different roles. As we see women in all sorts of locations in the New Testament, we see them in the upper room at the feast of Jesus, or at the feet of Jesus, learning alongside the disciples. We see them leading churches. We see them in the home and at the tomb, at the Passover meal before the crucifixion, anointing Jesus washing his feet, serving at the well, and even receiving on the receiving end of stones in the hands of angry mobsters. So we see different roles, different locations. We see women in varied responsibilities and past. Those who had shame and guilt, demon-possessed, some were, some were serving, some were learning, teaching, leading, caring for others, compassionate, wise, and one even giving all she had as with her two mites. And Jesus proclaiming, she's given everything. Some give a lot, but she gave everything. So don't believe the lie for a minute because you don't look like somebody, somebody else. You don't dress like somebody. You don't look like somebody. You, they, you don't have the past that somebody else has. You didn't have the good grannies in your life to raise you or to look at you and, and instill good qualities in you. You didn't have the parents like somebody else. Don't let the enemy tell you you don't have purpose and that you have nothing to say and nothing to show for it. Amen? Amen. So no matter the role, no matter the location, no matter the personality in the past, they all had the same thing in common a very precious treasure in earthen vessels. It's why we call ourselves sisters, why we can walk in a room full of everyone, different stories, roles, past, locations, and everything, and I can meet you and be a sister because we have this commonality and we have the common bond of Jesus. All right, so let's look at chapter two, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. You there? Paul says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Let's look at that verse 14 again. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And all you young living oil pushing people out there, you thought you had the best fragrance on the market, right? Right? So, right, it, Paul speaks of this just diffusing um, Christ that is within us into a room. And so, as many of you know, if you, your wife's a young living, um, diffusing, packing oil, packing mama, you know that she takes the water, she puts it in a little, this little thing, and it might glow, might light up, and it just, and she adds a couple drops of this, she adds a couple drops of that, and all of a sudden, the room starts changing, Right? It can bring a calm to the room. It can help us breathe better. I don't know about you, but we do breathe at my house because we all have chronic sinus issues, right? Especially in the springtime. 
But even more importantly than that, we have Christ within us. So what about those diffusing that, you know, it, it changes the room. You may, people in the room may not even be able to necessarily pick it up, but you notice a difference. The other day, just this week, Doug had walked down to use the restroom, and I went in, and I was like, you know, because stomach bugs going around, all these things, and I'm just like, and I'm spraying the hallway. I don't even know if Matt smelled it, but I'm, I'm spraying the hallway to, um, with On Guard, and I'm just like, you know, I haven't used that in a while. And Doug comes up, and he was just like, what's that smell? What's that? It? What is it? You know, but he noticed it. He couldn't necessarily pick up on it, but he noticed it. And right, and that's a lot of times how we should be when we walk in a room. So I would ask you, what kind of smell are you giving off when you walk in a room? <laughs> Do people notice a difference? Do you change the environment when you walk in a room? Do things change? Do people begin to notice their language? Do people begin to apologize? Like, ooh, I shouldn't have said that, sorry. You know, I, re I remember when that first started happening in my own life, and at first I was like offended. I was just like, why? Why you gotta, why you gotta be that way? Why you gotta point me out? Because I'm kind of like in the background, I'm like why you gotta point me out like that? But then I started to realize like, they noticed something different. Like their language changed if I was around. And I appreciated that. I began to appreciate that they saw me differently. And we can't be afraid of that. We can't be afraid of people to see us differently. Amen? All right. Let's skip over to chapter 3, verse 1. Let's pick up there. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or do we need as some other epistle to, of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistles, our epistle, written on our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with the ink by the Spirit, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. You are an epistle. It's a liter literary work in a form of a letter or a series of letters. And here Paul's telling the Corinthian church, you are our epistles. Your life, after hearing the gospel, is, speaks ministry, and it gives, and it shows the power of the gospel. It's your story, right? We all have that story. We all have, hopefully, a story, but there's a point in that story. It's the pinnacle of when we meet Christ, something supernatural happens. We're changed. If you don't have that supernatural experience, today could be your day. It doesn't have to go on like that. I promise you, Christ, when you encounter Christ, he changes your life. He changes you. He brings, he brings healing to your life. He brings um, forgiveness to your life. And so I just want to encourage you to share that. Share your story. But don't forget to share Christ. We had a moment with our, our um, small group uh, two weeks ago of just at encouraging them. Man, you know, we hear a lot about you know, sharing your story, and sometimes we'll skirt around kind of our testimony, and we'll share a few things. Don't forget to share about Christ, because your story has no meaning outside of him. It has no power to change anybody. It has no power to encourage anybody. Outside of Christ, it's just another story. Right. Amen? And we all love good storytellers, right? We got Bruce Deal that comes in. Um, he can have us laughing hysterically one minute. He can have us soberly acknowledging the evil that's in the world another minute. And then crying the next. But at the end, it all comes down to Christ. And at the end, it's all that matters. Amen? That's where the power is. All right, skip over to verse, or chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, now therefore, because of what I've spoken to you in chapter 2, it's because, you, because you, you, Christ is in you and you should be diffusing that and, and it should be coming out of you. And, and in, because of chapter 3, of you're of an epistle and you have a story to tell and all these things. It says, therefore, because of all this, because you've encountered Christ and because you are different now, therefore, see, we have this ministry as we have received mercy. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling the word of, of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, 
commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, but, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ the Lord, ourselves and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the... For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power of God may, may be the, sorry, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Since we have this ministry that we have, as we have received mercy, so many of us, you know, you know we look, and I, I, I hear people like, I just, I, I just need to, I want to be in ministry, and I want to do this, you know, I, I, I want something. But what, sometimes their heart's just looking for a platform, you know, and I would say just, you have a ministry. You don't need a platform. Quit seeking a platform and just seek people. Seek somebody to share the word of God with. Let's just start there. Should we just, you know, let's just seek out people and share our story with them. Amen. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Basically, this was a fragile clay pot. And you may feel very weak or broken, fragile, pieced together, and barely keeping it together. But that's the beauty of the pot, because it was never about the pot. It was about what was inside. Amen? So um, if you'll put up that picture. So, we have, so this was a very common practice to Paul. These were... Um, what would happen back in those times would, when, if there was unsettling times, changes of governments, um, wars, and that people would bring up all their money, all that they could, and they would put it in a pot and bury it so that in hopes that it would not be taken so that they could still have the treasure and their finances um, once the unsettledness had come to an end. And so we have this, um, we can see these, so they... Um, recently did a dig, and in a field found multiple of these, anywhere from 50 to 50,000 coins in some of these pots. And so Paul recognized, and which was speaking to them, something that was very, um, very relative to them, was you have something very special in you. Even though you're just a fragile clay pot, you have Christ within you. Amen. Um, Jesus even used this example when describing the kingdom. In Matthew 13 and 14, he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold it so that he, had, so he could buy the field. Rest assured, it is worth giving everything for the treasure that is within you. Amen. So why in the world with this great, awesome treasure within us, would we try to settle and say that we don't have a place to, because of a label or who we are or our past or anything else? We have treasure within you. Share it. Amen. Walk in confidence, woman of God and sisters, and speak up and share. You have something very valuable. And can I just say that as, you know, of course I'm just living in the now, but we need it. We need our children need it, right? Our society needs it. We need to be voices in the midst of a chaotic world. Amen? Amen. All right, let's move on. Purpose-driven woman within the home. All right. You can flip over there. We're going to look at Proverbs 31. What? You're still not going to Ephesians? All right. <laughs> So before we jump in, let me just um, maybe change the way we look at the Proverbs 31 woman. So I'm just going to be just real for a minute. So when I was young, uh, married, had young kids, it seemed like every woman's anything that I went to was about Proverbs 31. And I was just like, for crying out loud, is that it? Is that all you got? You know, and it was, it was, it was the two things. It was, it was a list that I saw it as a list of checklists. And I'm thinking, my goodness, give me one more thing or tell me one more thing to do for somebody or be for somebody. And I'm going to scream. I'm just being honest. That was me. 
You know, right? I got babies, and I got, I, you know, I got a husband, I got the home, I got work, I got this, and, and you know, and it, is, and it was just check boxes, right? It was just one more thing to add to my list, and so then, or I would see it in the opposite way, walking away in condemnation, being like, you're not that, and you're not that, and you're not that, and so there was really just these two flip sides, so I've always had this, you know, even though I've grown and matured, and I've looked in at Proverbs 31, and I, you know, I get it, and I thought about understand. I thought I understood it a little bit better. And three weeks ago, Doug's like, "I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to speak because you need lots of time." And I, <laughs> yes, you did. That's exactly what you said. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to tell you now, you're going to need to, and I want it to be on Proverbs 31. And I'm telling you, my first initial response was, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, and so I began, I was studying and I was praying and I'm like, oh God, show me and, you know, all this stuff. And, and finally, the moment, you know, I, I kind of throw, I throw baby fits in the, for the Lord sometimes and, and like really kind of snatches me up, smacks me on the butt, and just like, get a hold of yourself, person, you know, get a hold of yourself, woman. And so I'm just like, okay, all right, I got it. So, but he really just began to just teach me and show me. He's like, why in the world do you see this passage of Scripture through that lens? You, n- you don't read any other Scripture like you read this. And so I thought, okay, so I'll read it again. And as I read it again, and then I just read it again, I began to see not a list of tasks, not a list of comparisons, but really a list of giftings. And really a list of of giftings that, you know, sometimes I've really taken for granted. And a list of things that I thought I've really, like, overlooked. And maybe I've done some well, and I've really failed at a some, too. And I really dropped the ball with some of it. But God's gracious and he's merciful. And so I, as I read it again, um, I just want us to take another look at it and, and, cautious, and just try to not see check boxes and checklists, right? All right, let's read it. Virtuous woman, or the virtuous wife, starting at verse 10. So Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous wife, for her worth is far above rubies? The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have have no lack of gain. He does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for the household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it, and her profits she plants it, and from her profits she plants a vineyard. She girds her, herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She works out. <laughs> she perceives that her merchandise is good and that her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. Let me just read that. We're going to come back to this verse 19. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds the spindle. Verse 20. She extends her hand to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. Mine are gym shorts and t-shirts, but it's okay. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates and when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. So as I begin to just decipher this and just kind of break it down, and I really saw three areas 
of a woman in the home, her influence, right? And, and so the one was first to her husband, second, the operation and management of the home, and third, two of the children. So first of all, to her husband, let's take a look at it. Verse 11 says, the heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She can't be trusted with the most fragile of items, someone's heart. She holds the heart of her husband, and she doesn't seek to mistreat him or plot against him. She tr he trusts her and has confidence that she is always looking out for his best interests. Because she has this ability to influence her husband, she must never use it to manipulate him. The previous chapters of Proverbs, including plenty of warnings about the misuse and vile women who manipulate men. Go and read it. Proverbs. It's all through Proverbs. I'm, I'm sure Solomon wished at the end of his life he had wished listened to his own advice. Amen? She can be trusted to keep him in tune with all those in the home. No doubt, as mothers, we recognize um, likely more quickly than our husbands when things are going on. The emotional needs of the home. When a child is hurting, when the marriage needs work, when something, it, it's okay. Like, just because he doesn't notice it doesn't make him unengaged or uninterested. He's not like you. He's wired different than you. He's different than you. He has different giftings than you. So just because, you're like, I wish he would just know. No, that don't work, right? That doesn't work. He doesn't know because God's not wired him that way to know. Amen? All the men said, yes, preach it, sister. <laughs> so, so, right, I'm not giving you men a cop-out to be unengaged or to not be there and not be intentional, but just because he doesn't see it doesn't make him unengaged or uninterested. Just talk to him. Use your words, right? That's what we tell our children. Use your words and talk to him. Tell him. Hey, you know what? Not, hey, you gotta get off that game and do this and blah, 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 and your children, blah. No, just talk to him. Hey, did you know this happened at school this week? So-and-so probably could use a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with you. So-and-so needs a little affirming with, with their dad because things were tough this week. Somebody needs to come alongside them from their dad and say, you're doing good, kid. Keep it up. It's all right. You have failings, you have, we all do. Learn from them and teach them. Amen? Amen. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. You can build up and tear down your husband very quickly. A lot of spouses like to vent about their spouse. Women, a lot of times more so than men, I don't really hear a lot of men venting, like, oh, I got to vent to you. You know what she did? No, usually it's women. But let me just give you this little proverb from Proverbs 29, verse 11. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Let's be sure we're on the wise end of the proverb, ladies. Amen? Amen. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She is trustworthy, and he can be confident in her virtue and right motives and her honesty. This is also shows the commitment that she has to her husband is for life. Not just when things are good, not just when, all the, when everything's great, and there's plenty of money in the bank, and everybody's got jobs, but when it's hard and it's difficult. If you are constantly wavering in your commitment to your marriage when things aren't great, let me tell you, you need to stop. You need to stop. Because the constant, if you see your door to your home as just a swinging gate, I can come and go anytime I want and it's no big deal, you are sadly mistaken. Because it, is, it will affect your family and it will affect your home and divorce is very difficult and very real. Amen? Amen. Wives, guard against making your children first. This is tough, right? Because those little ones, they need us, right? 
and we're, they need us so much. But at the end, they're meant to leave. Just last summer, I was, um, I was walking at the track and listening to a couple podcasts. And you guys remember Dr. Henry Cloud? He was pretty popular in the 90s. And, and like he's elderly now, real. But he still does this little podcast. And, and I was listening to it, and um, he said, you know, if, mothers and fathers, if you want, especially mothers, if you want your ch- children's marriages to succeed, you must let them leave. They're supposed to leave and cleave. A lot of mothers, especially, want to hold on to our children, even while they're adults, and they're supposed to be cleaving to someone else. Amen? Amen. And in the process, we've lost our own relationship of cleaving to our husbands. So it is in only a season that you have your children in your home. So in that season, we're going to talk about that season, do it well and manage well, but do not let them take the priority and position of your relationship with your spouse. I know Nicole and Kevin just went to a marriage conference, and they do it every year. Figure it out. Spend time. Like ours is, we we go get coffee. Sometimes it's very, sometimes it's bad coffee. But listen, it's, regardless, I'm just, I'm just with my husband. I'm just, we got 40 minutes down there. We get coffee, we will leave, we're coming back. It's 40 minutes, 40 minutes of just me, just him. Sometimes we talk a lot and sometimes we don't say a word and it's good, right? So stay focused on your marriage. The best thing you can do for your children is have a great marriage. Have an awesome marriage in every aspect of it. Amen? All right. So management of the home. Simply put, let me just... So we got the home and the management, but I know, like, okay, was that, does that mean that I can't work outside the home? I'm not here to tell you that. She obviously, she's buying, she's buying land, but, but here's the difference. Whether you work inside the home and outside, or you're just a stay-at-home mom, I don't mean that just, but you know what I mean. If you're working inside the home or you're working inside and outside, here's the reason that it's a little bit different is that your motives and your ambition should be that I work outside the home to benefit the home, not to benefit me and my career. A lot of women lose sight of that, and their jobs outside the home become their own personal endeavors, and it becomes them. A recent Forbes article on women in the workforce found an overwhelming number of them felt no purpose even after achieving lifelong career goals. They were left empty. All their seeking, all their hard work, all their endeavors led them to great careers, but still very empty and very unsatisfied. This is from Forbes. Forbes reasoned it was all because they failed to realize and see the purpose behind their work. So let's look at verse 10 again. It says, Who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies? I believe somewhere along the way, we, as women, we didn't find our calling in the home very worthy anymore. We didn't feel like it was enough. We didn't feel like the lives that were in our home were enough. It felt like the calling wasn't enough. Um, I'll share this story. Um, Joel was probably two and a half. Adam was a screaming, screaming little baby. He screamed for six months. And, and for months, I would go to church. We didn't have nursery or anything like that. But I was just like, I spent all my time back there because I got this screaming baby. I got this other baby that's running around like chaos. And, and you know, and it was during that time that, that Doug, is, Doug was preaching a lot. And <laughs> he's going to love it. So I, we would come into church and like, I'm chaos, right? I'm just like, I'm just trying to get babies and changed in diapers. And he walks in like he's just Moses stepping down off the mountain. And, (laughs) you know, (laughs) angels singing as he walks through the door. And I'm just like, I'm just glad to be here, you know. And I would think, I don't even get to sit in service anyway. I should just sit home. This is ridiculous. And I was just, you know, and it was one of those times we were in revival service. And I, I was just feeling really 
pity party for myself. Again, like I throw baby fits. And, and I was just feeling sorry for myself. And late, I don't know if it, was, it must have been around Easter or Mother's Day or something like that. So we went up and we went to Doug's grandma's. And she, you know, she has tons of grandkids. She never gets anybody anything except at Christmas, she, you know, or something like that. And so she gets me, and she's like, hey, I have something for you. I'm like, okay. And so she gives me this little angel thing, and it's got two little kids, and it just said, motherhood, the greatest calling. And as I was sitting, I, I remembered instantly, I thought, I've just been griping and complaining, oh, Doug, Doug, Doug. And here I am, and, like, you know, everybody sees him, but they don't see me. They don't see me, the, you know, like, I, I make, see I make him happen. Like, see? <laughs> Who do you think's watching the kids when he's up on the mountain? Me. <laughs> and really feeling like I get nothing. I get no accolades. I can't even put makeup on or fix my hair. You know, and it was just, oh, you know. But I think in that simple moment from his grandmother, she didn't know. I hadn't said anything to her. She had no clue what I was going through, nothing. And she gave me that, and she's like, and it was just a reminder, and God just just touched it and just said, motherhood is a greatest calling. He may have been, has different giftings and callings and things in his life that I'm using him for, but I'm using you right now. Because that little baby and that little two-year-old, they need you. And they need you to teach them. And they need you to shape them and mold them. And when their shoulders start turning and they want to walk a different way, you just need to grab them by the shoulder and turn them back. And when they want to resist, you just need to turn them back and just show them, that's not the way, son. That's not the way you go. That's not it. This is. This is. I've showed you. Remember? I've taught you. I've shown you. And we just keep gathering. And we just keep gathering. We just keep bringing them to a place. And we just keep them bringing them back to where it's real, right? Amen. All right. So let's get to the children. And this is where I want to end. Oh, Joe, if you want to come on up where he's at. But anyway. Oh, there he is. He's going to play some music for us because I want to do something special here at the end. Amen. Because I feel like this is the greatest calling, like I said, and purpose we have while our children are in the home. She watches over the ways of her household. She supplies the material needs for the household. But she's also very perceptive. She instills in them the word of God. She lives a life that exemplifies Jesus. She engages them in her faith and encourages them to grow in their own. Perhaps watching our children weather their own storms as they transition is part of the hardest job of a parent that we can have. It's in those times that we stand on the working of our hands, right? And we're going to go back there to verse 19. I love this picture. They put that back up. or I put. Okay, so I had to look it up. I didn't know what a distaff was, and I barely knew what a spindle was. But I think the word of God just speaks such clarity to me in this. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hand holds a spindle. Now this distaff was this Q-tip looking thing, and she would hold it. But what it was was pieces, pieces that really weren't meant for spinning or weaving or holding anything together. But once they passed through her hands, then they could be used. And I, God just really spoke it. She's like, you can take the chaos of life and all the things that are in your home and pass through your hands and make it worth purpose and bring purpose to them. And it can be held together. I think of my, and I thought of my granny's quilts and I thought, they're all just scraps, scraps of material, not really meant for much. But in the hands of my grannies, they were able to weave them together and make them something very beautiful. And I think that's the gifting of you in the home as a wife, as a mother, as a woman, to take all the loose ends, all the, all the chaos, be able to bring it together, it go through your hands, 
and now have purpose. Amen? And it's constantly, even in our own, in our children's lives, and you think, oh, what's that look like? You, must, you know, the Norman house must look like, you know, church service every Sunday. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> we are loud. Joel, um, Joel's girlfriend, is, you know, she, you know, she, she's new. She's new to the house. Um, she's about eight months in or so. And like, I, like she looks shell-shocked the first time she's at the house, and I'm just going, I'm sorry, we are loud. We are loud. It is boyhood, and it is loud. Um, and you know, like, we walk into rooms loud, and we engage each other loud, and, but it's all good. And we're competitive. We're competitive over everything, right? And everything's just, you know, uh, this competition and and, you know, I can do, it. and we've got testosterone overload all the time, but it's fun. Amen? It is fun. Um, but really, it's not, it's, so you think, oh, well, well, where do you do it? You know, how is it? You know, what do we do? What, do, you know, as mothers, please tell me. Listen, it's in the little stuff, day-to-day -day stuff. It's when you pick them up from school, and you got a conversation, you got to five-minute conversation on the way home. It's just pouring into them when they tell you about a friend or somebody's this or that, and you just, you just stop doing the dishes or whatever you're doing and give them some time, share with them, teach them, share, let them see you in the morning getting up and reading your Bible. They need to see it from you first. Not just you telling them about it. Not a pastor. Not Pastor Matt. Not Pastor Doug. They need to see it from you. I remember there was um, this baseball season. Of course, I don't think there's any more expensive sport than baseball. And we were at a sporting goods store, and we, we had got everybody's stuff, right? Including a couple bats. Which, ugh, I'm like, are you serious? Like, I that much for a bat? That's ridiculous. So anyway, whatever. So of course, no one likes to go through the checkout line. So mom, no one. They load me up with all the stuff, and they're like, we'll wait for you in the car. <laughs> one thought would be that they're pulling up the vehicle, but no. <laughs> they're just waiting. So whatever. And so, they're ringing up stuff, you know, ching, 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 and I'm just going, oh, good grief, and I'm not really paying attention. I go ahead and pay for it, and we're on our way out. I'm on my way out the door. I get out there, and as I'm walking, I'm like, I don't sound, that just didn't sound right, you know, that amount, and I get to the car. <laughs> Stop, and I look at the receipt, and I'm looking. I'm like, he didn't charge me for the bat. And I'm just like, the very expensive bat. <laughs> and I realized in that moment, what was worth more? Teaching my children, no matter the cost, to be honest, to go back in, to say, hey, you didn't charge me for this bat. I mean, like, there's no security on it, whatever. We were, we were free and clear. But that bat would have been way more expensive had we just drove off. And so, I'm not going to lie, it took us about a minute to decide. <laughs> Do we go in? I don't know. Man, mm, I don't know. But we went back inside, and I'm just like, and he was a young guy. He's like, oh my gosh. I can't believe I didn't charge you for that bat. And I was just like, man, it's all right. You know, just uh, ring it up. You know, it's fine. And I walked out, and I thought, my kids need to see that. You know, it's not so much about the kid behind the counter or even really, you know, it's, of course, honesty and all those things. And, but my kids need to see that. Amen? So I didn't want to do two things today. Um, one, if you are 
wife, mother, and your husband is here with you today. You may not be sitting together, so I want you to get together. So sit by your wife, sit by your husband, if you're not. Okay. All right. So I wanted to pray. I wanted to pray. If you, at the last, in verse 31, it says, Give her the fruit of her hands. I also wanted to speak to maybe some of the, the mothers in the room whose children have already, you're after that season. And you're wondering, did I do enough? Did I do enough? Did I teach them enough? And now you're left to trust God with what you've done. And that he would give you the fruit of your hands. Right, that's the prayer. That all that gathering of the loose pieces and all that work done with your hands and all those times of the morning devotionals and all the times of, of you praying, the late night prayers, when it seems like it's tough and it's difficult and now you're left to trust. Trust that God's moving in their lives and that God's forming and equipping them. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, please like and share on social so we can spread God's word. If you'd like to learn more about The Bridge or to give, visit our website at thebridge129.org. Again, we're so glad you're here with us today. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you.